Well, I'm thrilled to be here for the seventh time. It's hard to imagine. As Kirk just said, finished six years. It's the seventh annual conference I've been privileged to address you. Um, the relationships that I've developed with many of you have been life-changing for me. And I'm definitely a better person for have been a part of this community. Uh, as all of you know, I would not be able to do my job if it wasn't for the great staff at SAIS. So uh, please allow me to introduce them all by name, for it is they who really make SAIS work. We have a lot of heads of school in the room, and you know exactly what I mean. Um, we we uh, are, the, are the point person by name and title, but we know who really makes it work. Two vice presidents, Lori Spear, executive vice president, and Damian Cavanaugh, vice president, accreditation and membership. We have Julia Grantham, director of administration, Emily Goldman, accreditation coordinator, uh, Leanne Minnick, director of member services and technology, Sarah Stewart, content and member engagement manager, Melissa Hunter, events and marketing coordinator, and Danielle Swart, assistant to the president. I hope that all of you know that all of us at SAIS are privileged to serve you and um, stand ready to help any way that we possibly can uh, to help you serve the children in your schools. I know this is the point where that I've, uh, many of you have become accustomed to me telling a story about my wonderful wife Rhonda or something else along those lines. Indeed, she did have a birthday, but we're not going to talk about birthdays anymore. I learned better than that. But I am going to tell a story that kind of relates to her in that our youngest daughter went off to college this year. And Rhonda and Mackenzie, um, Heather, my oldest daughter's little sister, uh, were very close in that they traveled uh, to school, commuted together for, for several years, and, and Rhonda was just always around her. So uh, Rhonda is, in fact, she's probably tearing up right now talking about it. So when you see her, please put your arm around her and comfort her. Uh, she's very sad, and I don't know if it's she's sad because she has to be by herself with me in the house or whether Mackenzie left. But when Mackenzie was going off to college, she, went to, she was going to school in Texas, and so she came to me one day and said, Dad, would you drive my car to Texas when I go to school? And so I'm thinking, wow, a road trip. We're going to bond. We're going to hang together for 14 hours. Yes, dear. And I was thinking of all the good conversation that we hadn't had recently and that we would get to have. And uh, I said, sure, sweetheart, it will be a great trip. I look forward to the visit. And she goes, oh, no. I said, I'm going to fly with mom. I want you to drive my car. <laughs> so the good dad that I am, she flew her precious little behind with her mom in an airplane. And I drove 14 hours to Texas and took her car to her. So if anyone wants parenting skills, don't come and ask me. I have <laughs> spoiled them rotten. The 2013 annual conference is entitled The Global Future Preparing Students and Shaping Schools. It is my belief that school leaders must be intentional about preparing students for their future. A future that will require that they be culturally empathic and globally aware. We often talk about becoming 21st century schools. I have argued for several years that we need a new term than 21st century. Uh, after all, we're at 2013, 13 years into it. However, I've not yet come up with a suitable phrase. So I would like to propose a slightly different way of looking at this. However, by saying all of the SAIS schools listed on the screen are 21st century schools. These are the SAIS schools that are opening for classes tomorrow. And given that the year is 2013, they are 21st century schools. However, given that your schools are by definition 21st century schools, the real question to be answered is whether your individual school is preparing students for their 21st century future. 
The conversations of 21st century education that have occurred over the past decade have been essential in assisting schools in making necessary innovation for preparing students. Schools must prepare students for their future, which includes developing the appropriate social and intellectual skills as well as the proficiencies with current technologies. It will require educators to be comfortable with the technological tools of the future, while recognizing that much of what has always gone on in schools for centuries is still relevant in the 21st century. The human dimension of school has changed little. Teachers are still called on to inspire, stimulate curiosity, empower, motivate, and provide structure for students. Teachers must still be able to communicate effectively, be empathic, and offer unconditional positive regard in a congruent fashion. We do not need to scrap everything and start over. However, we do need to remain current, relevant, and innovate as needed. We must also be future-oriented and willing to adopt new strategies or techniques as new technological tools enable our efforts. We must strive to anticipate the future of our students in order to prepare them for their future. The focus of this conference addresses one of those futures that I believe is essential for you to anticipate, the global future in which our students will work and lead. A future that involves global competition for jobs. A future where collaboration and problem solving occur on a global scale. A future where nations cannot act in isolation regarding their impact on Earth. Over the past several years, I have become quite a fan of Steve Jobs and his life. In my estimation, his greatest genius was his ability to anticipate the user. He knew that you needed an iPad even before you knew you needed an iPad. At this very conference four years ago, there were no iPads in the room. The iPad was introduced in April of 2010. And today, many of you wonder how you lived without it. I have a family member that meets that description. I'm convinced that the best school leaders excel at anticipating the future in ways that others do not. I am convinced that educators who have the ability to anticipate the future of their students are able to more completely prepare their students for the future in which they will live. And in this vein of anticipating the future, let's share some thoughts designed to stimulate you and your thinking about the future. I'm not suggesting that anyone can predict the future with 100% accuracy, with the exception of Kirk's eight ball, lucky eight ball, magic eight ball, can't, I can't remember what it's called, the eight, the eight ball, you know. <laughs> However, consideration of plausible scenarios is essential for educators. And given that the focus of this conference is global education, let's consider some plausible scenarios for our students' future. In December of 2012, the fifth National Intelligence Council report, Global Trends 2030 Alternative Worlds, was published. This report is a synthesis of global conditions and the opinions of a variety of experts from around the world. The purpose of this report is to suggest plausible scenarios of the future conditions globally in an effort to anticipate solutions for those conditions. The report clarifies that it is not a prediction, but rather an analysis of current global trends and where they likely will lead us in the future. In this NIC report, current global megatrends are analyzed in light of possible game-changing events to suggest potential worlds of 2030. This report contends that there are four megatrends interacting with six variables or game changers that will determine what kind of transformed world we will inhabit in 2030. This particular report is the fifth of its type and is designed to provide a framework for the U.S. to think about the future. 
It is not designed to predict the future, but rather to identify potential worlds that could exist in 2030. It is also worth noting that in the previous four such NIC reports, the most conspicuous misestimation was an underestimating the speed in which change occur. Putting 2030 in perspective, the kindergarten students in your class will be graduating from college in 2030. Many of you have kindergartners in your schools. That's putting the year we're talking about in perspective. I think that it's also worth noting, uh, is also worth providing perspective on the year 2030. The four megatrends discussed as currently shaping the world's future are individual empowerment, diffusion of power, demographic patterns, and growing food, water, and energy nexus. First, Individual empowerment vector. According to this report, the first megatrend of individual empowerment will accelerate substantially during the next 15 to 20 years, owing to poverty reduction and a huge growth of the global middle class, greater educational attainment, and better health care. The growth of the global middle class constitutes a tectonic shift for the first time. A majority of the world's population will not be impoverished and the middle classes will be the most important social and economic sector in the vast majority of countries in the world. On the one hand, we see the potential for greater individual initiatives as key to solving the mounting global challenges over the next 15 to 20 years. On the other hand, in a tectonic shift, individuals and small groups will have greater access to lethal and disruptive technologies particularly precision strike capabilities, cyber instruments, and bioterror weaponry, enabling them to perpetuate large-scale violence, a capability formerly a monopoly of the states. The second megatrend, this fusion of power among countries will have dramatic impact by 2030. Asia will have surpassed North America and Europe combined in terms of global power based on GDP, population size, military spending, and technological investment. China alone will probably have the largest economy surpassing that of the United States a few years before 2030. In a tectonic shift, the health of the global economy increasingly will be linked to how well the developing world does, more so than the traditional West. In addition to China, India, and Brazil, regional players such as Colombia, Indonesia, Nigeria, South Africa, and Turkey will become especially important to the global economy. Meanwhile, economies of Europe, Japan, and Russia are likely to continue their slow relative declines. The third megatrend relates to the demographic patterns. It is believed that in the world of 2030, a world in which growing global population will have reached somewhere close to 8.3 billion people, up from 7.1 billion in 2012, four demographic trends will fundamentally shape, although not necessarily determine, most countries' economic and political conditions and relations among countries. These trends are aging, a tectonic shift for both the West and increasingly more for developing countries, a still significant shrinking number of youthful societies and states, migration, which will be increasingly cross-border issues, and growing urbanization. Owing to rapid urbanization in the developing world, the volume of urban construction for housing, office space, and transport services over the next 40 years could roughly equal the entire volume of such construction to date in the history of the world. And fourth, megatrends suggest that demand for food, water, and energy will grow by approximately 35, 40, and 50 percent respectively, owing to an increase in the global population and the consumption patterns of an expanding middle class. Climate change will worsen the outlook for availability of these critical resources. We are not necessarily headed into a world of scarcities, but policymakers and their private sector partners will need to be proactive to avoid such a future. Many countries probably won't have the wherewithal to avoid food and water shortages without massive help 
from outside. Now interacting with these trends, if we think of the trends as being vectors that are running through society based on the way things are happening now, how they are likely to turn out. Interacting with this trends are fact six factors that they consider game changers. If you think of the trends as vectors, the game changers can be seen as obstructions that will change the trajectory of the vector. Therefore, it is the interaction of the megatrends and the game changers according to this report that will determine future worlds. First game changer is a crisis prone global economy. The international economy almost certainly will continue to be characterized by various regional and national economies moving at significantly different speeds. A pattern reinforced by the 2008 global financial crisis. The second game changer is the governance gap. During the next 15 to 20 years, as powers become even more diffuse than today, a growing number of diverse state and non-state actors, as well as subnational actors such as cities, will play important governance role. According to this report, there are serious questions as to whether or not governments will be able to stay up with the changes that will be occurring over the next 20 years. Game changer number three is the potential for increased conflict. Historical trends during the past two decades show fewer major armed conflicts and where conflicts remain fewer civilian and military casualties than in previous decades. Maturing age structures in many developing countries point to continuing declines in interstate conflict. We believe that the disincentives will remain strong for the great powers uh, to, to not engage in conflict. The stakes would be too high. Nevertheless, they warn about being cautious, the need to be cautious about the prospects of further declines in the number and intensity of interstate conflicts and interstate conflict remains a possibility. Game changer number four, wider scope of regional instability. Regional dynamics in several different theaters during the next couple of decades will have potential to spill over and create global insecurity. The Middle East and South Asia are the two regions most likely to trigger broader instability. In the Middle East, the youth bulge, a driving force of the recent Arab Spring, will give way to gradually aging population. With new technologies beginning to provide the world with other sources of oil and gas, the region's economy will need to become increasingly diversified. And the fifth game changer talked about in this report, the impact of new technologies. Four technology arenas will shape the global economic, social, and military developments as well as the world's communities, actions pertaining to the environment by 2030. Information technology is entering the big data era. Process power and data storage are becoming almost free. Networks in the cloud will provide global access and pervasive services. Social media and cybersecurity will be large new markets. Finally, the sixth game changer discussed in this report is the role of the United States. How the United States international role evolves during the next 15 to 20 years is quite uncertain. And whether the US will be able to work with new partners to reinvent the international system will be among the most important variables in the future shape of the global order. Although the United States and the West relative decline vis-a-vis -vis the rising states is inevitable, its future role in the international system is much harder to project. The degree to which the U.S. continues to dominate the international system could vary widely. The U.S. most likely will remain first among equals, among the, most, uh, the other great powers in 2030 because of the preeminence across a range of power dimensions and legacies of leadership role. More important than just its economic weight, the United States' dominant role in the international politics has derived from its preponderance across the board in both hard and soft power. Nevertheless, the rapid rise of other countries, the unipolar mo moment is over, 
and the Pax Americana, the era of the American ascendancy in international politics that began in 1945 is winding down quickly. In analyzing the current trends and projecting their interaction with potential game changers, the NIC report outlines four potential worlds in 2030. The first potential world of 2030 it lists is labeled as a stalled engines world, a scenario in which the risk of interstate conflict rise owing to a new great game in Asia was chosen as one of the bookends illustrating the most plausible worst case scenario. Arguably, darker scenarios are imaginable, including a complete breakdown and reversal of globalization due to potentially to a large scale conflict on the order of a World War I or World War II, but such outcomes do not seem probable. Major powers might be drawn into conflict, but they do not see any of such any such tensions or bilateral conflict igniting a full-scale war. More likely, peripheral powers would step in to try to stop a conflict. Indeed, as we have stressed, major powers are conscious of the likely economic and political damage to engaging in a major conflict. Moreover, unlike in the interwar war period, Completely undoing economic interdependence or globalization would seem to be harder in this more advanced technological age with ubiquitous connections. Stalled engines is nevertheless a bleak future. Drivers behind such an outcome would be a US and Europe that turn inward, no longer interested in sustaining the global leadership. Under this scenario, the Eurozone unravels quickly, causing Europe to be mired in recession. The U.S. energy revolution fails to materialize, dimming prospects for an economic recovery. In the modeling which the McKinsey Company did for the NIC for this scenario, global economic growth falters and all players do relatively poorly. The next world of 2030 that is potential according to this report is called the fusion world. It's the other book in describing what is the most plausible best case scenario. This is a world in which the specter of a spreading conflict in South Asia triggers efforts by the US, Europe, and China to intervene and impose a ceasefire. China, the US, and Europe find other issues to collaborate on leading to a major positive change in their bilateral relations and more broadly leading to worldwide cooperation to deal with global challenges. The scenario relies on political leadership with each side overruling its more cautious domestic constituents to forge a partnership. Over time, trust is also built up as China begins a process of political reform bolstered by the increasing role it is playing in the international system. With the growing collaboration among the major powers, global multilateral institutions are reformed and made more inclusive. In this scenario, all boats rise substantially. Emerging economies continue to grow faster, but GDP growth in advanced economies also picks up. The global economy nearly doubles in real terms by 2030 to 132 trillion in today's dollars. The American dream returns with per capita incomes rising 10,000 per year. Chinese per capita income also expands rapidly, ensuring that China avoids the middle income trap. Technological innovation rooted in expanded exchanges and joint international efforts is critical to the world, staying ahead of the rising financial and resource constraints that would accompany a rapid boost in prosperity. The third potential world outlined is referred to as genie out of the bottle world. This is a world of extremes. Within many countries, inequalities dominate, leading to increased political and social tensions. Between countries, there are clear cut winners and losers. For example, countries in the Eurozone core, which are globally competitive, do well, while others on the periphery are forced to leave the EU. The EU single market barely functions. The US remains the pre preeminent power as it gains energy independence. Without completely disengaging, the US no longer tries to play global policeman. 
on every security threat. Many of the energy producers suffer from declining energy prices, failing to diversify their economies in times and are threatened by internal conflicts. Cities in China's coastal zone continue to thrive, but inequalities increase and split the party. Social discontent spikes as middle class expectations are not met except for very well connected. The fourth world of 2030, suggested by the NSIC report, is a non-state world. In this world, non-state actors, non-governmental organizations, or multinational businesses, academic institutions, and wealthy individuals, as well as subnational units, such as megacities, flourish and take the lead in confronting global challenges. An increasing global public opinion Consensus among elites and many of the growing middle classes on major global challenges. Poverty, the environment, anti-corruption, rule of law, and peace form the basis for their support. The nation state does not disappear, but countries increasingly organize and orchestrate hybrid coalitions of state and non-state actors which shift depending on the issue. No one is certain of what the world will look like in 2030. What we do know is that the kindergarten students in your school today will be graduating from college and entering this world. In reality, the world that these students inherit will likely be some combination of the four potential worlds just outlined by this NIC report. Nonetheless, their world will no doubt look different in many ways. The question for educators is, what will these students need from us that will prepare them to negotiate their future at the highest degree? How can we anticipate their future in a way that will afford them the greatest opportunity to achieve success, live a fruitful life, and lead the world in a positive direction? The conference you are about to experience is designed to provide you a more comprehensive understanding of the global future. I trust that you will be challenged, encouraged, motivated to understand the dynamics that will shape your students' future. Anticipating the future that your students will experience is essential for educators. This is what the 21st century school must do. The preparation that we afford the students is what they will use to negotiate their world. Let's do what is necessary so that we can be as prepared as possible to assist these students. I trust you will have a great conference and that you will all go back to your schools better prepared to serve your students. Thank you.